welcome back. Uh, thanks for coming back for our final talk of the day. Our next speaker, Tade Hakopian, is both a developer and a designer in architecture. Now, when we say architecture, we're talking about physical buildings this time, not software. Uh, when Tade started working on the latest high rise in San Francisco, he wondered how he could complete the project without losing his mind. Python came to the rescue, as it often does. Uh, so today, Tade will present his talk, Programming Your Way Up a Skyscraper, Python in the Built World. All right, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining me here today. I'll uh, get started here. And as mentioned, uh, I do have a background in architecture. Uh, I've worked as a manager of design technologist and an uh, amateur developer. Um, working on all things related to building design and construction, um, from modeling the buildings, drawing them, getting data out of the buildings, and working on disciplines like building information modeling, BIM, and virtual design and construction, BDC workflows, which is what we use these days in building anything so we can get the most information and data and preparation out of the project as possible before we build it so that we don't make mistakes. And over the years, I've been, you know, speaking and teaching about um, all things BIM, uh, visual scripting, and coding content. And here are some of the lessons, you know, I learned, and also a great overview of, you know, use of Python in the architecture world. And the main takeaway to get started with is that Python makes it possible. So this is a showcase of what I've used and what I've learned to make a project possible with Python. It's been a great support for architects and designers around the world, and. I just wanted to give you an overview of what's been going on. And yes, as mentioned, we have architects and we have architects. Um, I'm the traditional kind of architecture background. And uh, they also have the system architects for computer science. And they both uh, have a common ground with Alexander Christopher Alexander's panel language, the philosophy of design. Uh, really great stuff if you haven't checked it out. That's where the terminology comes from to kind of clear that all up. Um, so I work on the floor plan side of things, not so much the uh, system mapping, but over the years, I've been doing a little bit more system mapping. So it's a great resource for anybody out there, Christopher Alexander's panel language. And here are some of the projects I've worked on. They're big, uh, complex, and uh, they cost a lot of money, and they have lots of people, um, including, you know, high rises and ballparks and college complexes and, you know, even energy storage projects, which is kind of like Area 51 looking thing down here. Um, so it's always a matter of like, how can we do these things with uh, high precision? with a lot of uh, validity to them and also save us some time and effort and make sure we're doing these things right. It's a challenging environment when you go from like, you know, digital building blocks, like physical building blocks, uh, things get really complicated really quick. So we always try and look for every asset we can to help us along. And just give you a sense of the background architecture. Uh, traditionally an architect like this guy on the right here would sketch an idea out, uh, elaborate and draw plans for your design update them, re uh, respond to whatever the client wants, the limitations to the project site, cost, whatever. And you keep doing this until you're done. You just draw it on, you update it. A hundred years ago, when you only need to submit like 20 sheets of plans, like blueprints, easy, uh, not so bad, you could do this. It, there was only so many things you could do back then. Now things are a lot more complex and now you need like 2000, 30 by 40 inch sheets, like these table size sheets for today's projects. So it's a very wasteful, limited process to work that way. And we don't just draw sheets anymore. We use ourselves uh, 3D models like these. Uh, in this environment, uh, in building information modeling, what's great about this is not only do you get the geometry out of it, you can actually extract information like you know the surface area of all the floors and the walls and also the volume of the spaces. So you can get, use that for heating and cooling calculations and be able to really just draw the information out of the model. So now we have this great store of asset value that we can use to run operations with in code. This is not something we've been doing particularly long. Uh, software and architecture have been had a long history together, but when it came to the common use of it, uh, the last 10 years or so, it's really taken off. And these are some of the examples here as these kind of environments we work in. Now that we're digitally enabled, we can really extract some digital, uh, digital information out of it. And just to give you a sense of, I'll talk about BIM a lot. Just to give you a sense of this is building information modeling. It's a combination of design thoughts, like what you're trying to design, the data inside the design. Again, how big something is, how many there are, what kind of property is it, is it, you know, how thick is the wall, for example, and the geometry. So we have a 3D geometry. So it all comes together as BIM. And what's great about BIM, and this R right here represents the Revit software, is that it's a common data environment. 
So as long as you put into the storage of a given model, a, a BIM model, a 3D model like you saw prior, you actually get a, a relation to database uh, result out of it. So the whole model is a database. And not only will the database communicate update changes, like if a floor changes in one level, you can then update that for levels above and below. If a property changes on one type of floor, you can populate it throughout the entire project. You don't have to go and manually change all this stuff. So the, the stuff you saw, you model in the software will then update into a database, which is going to give you cool things like, you know, designs, plans. It's a little bit abstracted here, but the idea is in one place, you'll get the data, the design and the plans, which is great because then we can use uh, coding and to help us along. And in this environment, we can use this plaid system right here. This plaid little icon here is referring to a visual scripting medium called Dynamo. This has been my friend over the years. It's been able to take the data out of these BIM environments, both geometry and the database, and work with in ways I cannot work with in the uh, software itself because I'm trying to make something a little more um, automated or sophisticated that I cannot do out of the box. And what Dynamo lets me do is it's a low code visual scripting medium that you can interact with the API of the software without having to know how to code. Low code has been really great for a lot of people trying to learn and apply themselves in creating their own custom applications and software. And this was my gateway drug into Python. So I'll get into that a little bit myself. So just to give you a sense of what this visual scripting Dynamo thing looks like, it's like this. It, it, it's, it's just another you know set of blocks called modules connected to each other to get an output simple as that. I think you guys all seen something like this in the visual scripting environment. And you can do something as simple as adding two um, integers or floats together to get a value. Simple as that. It can work in that environment. But because we're talking geometry, because we're talking about 3D space and data related to it, we can do something more sophisticated. Like in this example, I could take a, a line called curve from the model drawn like this in this kind of spline and set points along the way and just use a slider going back and forth to figure out how many points I want. And then process that through a block, just trying to get a formula of endpoints. What's great about this is I don't have to do man this manually. If I want to say have a number of posts for a rail, I'm trying to figure out how many posts I need for a rail so that I don't you know, manually figure it out. I could just use a slider and help me geometrically represent them as points very smoothly. Designers and architects love visuals. They love playing around with toggles. So this is the kind of thing you do in Dynamo. It gives you a 3D mapping of what you're doing before you even put it into the model. And you can do really cool, unconventional workflows, like an example on the left here, make a warped wall out of the box on a lot of uh, some 3D modeling software. So this is not very easy, but through a series of uh, modules and transformations, you can make a warped wall and do some cool stuff, like put some artwork on it. These are the kind of things people go to these visual scripting solutions to create a data flow that they can make solutions for that they can't do otherwise out of the box or very challenging or it'll take too long or just not feasible. And this is the reason why a lot of designers are going down this route of learning the low code. And just an example here, just a quick breakdown, something I was using uh, a little project that I was putting together to demonstrate the use case is how can I use visual scripting to build, build a tower? And all we got here to guide you through this is the coordinate points in the upper left here, again, the sliders. I still have a, this is just a number slider showing 30 and a number sh slider showing 60. I can change these around as I want to change around the coordinates. They give me X, Y, and Z coordinates. And so I can modify these as necessary. The coordinates will then give me the positioning of a plane that I can populate the entire model with. So that said, I can take these coordinates, match it with content from my model environment saying, okay, I want a wall. I want levels and I want a certain type of floor, like a foundation slab at six inches. I can connect all these points together through some transformations in the modules. And by connecting the geometry with the types of assets I want them to match, I can then output floors and walls and levels. So all this means is I can very quickly, in this number of nodes right here in the Dynamo Visual Scripting environment, create something like this, an entire skyscraper. This is what I use as a uh, proof a concept that, yeah, you can quickly change the, you can quickly create a skyscraper geometry and populate it into a model environment. Left is Dynamo, right is the model environment, and then change the outline of the model environment. So if you want to add more corners, uh, more levels, uh, different angles, it's all possible. You just have to uh, modify the code. So these are the kind of things that's great because doing this manually will take you 
an hour or two just to get to this stage. Whereas I can quickly just change some low code here on the back end and it automatically updates and a designer can quickly iterate through some examples instead of having to painstakingly process them themselves. And it does it lends itself to exploration. Again, designers love touchy feeling stuff. They love trying things out, different options, kind of like virtual clay. You're trying to like mold it and shape it. So you have different options available to you. So this is what the visual scripting and 3D environment lets you do all in the same environment as Dymo environment. It's really cool. It's really great. People love seeing this stuff because they can see the results. Again, if you're not from a traditional CS background, uh, seeing text and numbers is not going to fly. People, even technically adept people who are like structural engineers and architectural designers who, ha who are comfortable in technical environments may not be so comfortable working on this is what makes them feel a lot better about it. They can see the, what they're getting out of it without having to uh, play around with code. Now, I may be asking me, great, but what does this have to do with Python? I'm getting to that. So what's really cool about all this is that the Dynamo environment comes with a comes with a Python script module. It's an IDE in, in Dynamo, which you can use to add your own script. This was my gateway of all things Python. This was four or five years ago, I started getting into this. And before that point, I really didn't know much about coding. Uh, I appreciated it. I appreciated what I did, but I didn't really know how to use it. Uh, it was a little bit of a, a learning curve for me because it, there was no easy entrance. Python made it super easy because all you have to do is use one of those Python, uh, using Python module to put into your Dynamo visual script that can then read to the C-sharp API uh, that is the actual uh, API for Revit and then populate the Revit environment. So it's a couple of wrappers and uh, compilers, but it does work. And it's much easier than me to sit down do the whole SDK, use the use the API, learn the API. It was it was a beast in the API. So this made things way less complicated and opened up some options. I couldn't believe how easy it was to iterate through a list. Like once I got the hang of that, I was like, this is great because then you could do some cool things like you know this, where you can just take a simple module import, bring in the Revit environment uh, in the beginning there. And then from there, just set a couple of variables, uh, including your inputs, that would be the those wires that would be like a default zero, like, you know, input wire. That's why you have an input zero. Then you set some coordinates, then you have your output list. And through a series of simple for loops, you get a whole uh, result of these squares floating into the environment, which would have been a lot more work if I, even if I did it with the visual scripting. What's cool about this, I could take that Python, fam uh, Python script, create the solids in the visual scripting 3D preview mod and then load it into elements in Revit. And while this might seem like, you know, kind of neat, it, what's great about here is let's say I want to do this with uh, furniture. Let's say I got for the sofa in like a hundred different um, hotel rooms, something to that effect. I could do it manually in the software itself, but it, this is a much faster way of placing it in there. If I know wh approximately where they all go or exactly where all the sofas go and use something like this to uh, iterate through them because, you know, hotel plans uh, tend to be pretty straightforward. They tend to be very, uh, uh, repetitive, I can use that and run it through and very quickly in, in a second after having this script, I can just populate the whole model with these um, with sofas or different kind of elements in a room or other repeating elements that need to go up in a certain format, which again, saves a lot of time and automates the process, but you can take it further than, than automation. And because, you know, this is a pretty simple sample, it's, it ain't much, but it's on to work. I'm big on the automation side, but you can do a lot more with it. You can do design related things with it. If you know, if you're pretty capable of how to manipulate design, you can take the Python script in Dynamo. And again, with some of the module imports, you can modify some parameters of, of width and length, um, use the Python um, interface to connect to the modules for the creating rectangles and points and vectors to create an axis. And all you gotta do is just you know, set a float for your uh, degrees, and there you go. You rotate the entire tower. Again, something that would have been very challenging to do in the native environment. So this has opened up a lot of uh, possibilities for editing your, your designs in uh, software that's not, you know, very uh, happy with non-90 degree lines. So you can even design with it. And you can take it further, just keep going with it in this case, and you can use... Uh, it to create some pretty uh, interesting geometry like this example, where the these steel beams are actually being aligned and each point above and below is different. And it is uh, 
a non-conventional curve here. So instead of having to painstakingly model that, you just put your um, inputs here, and then you set the different curves and parameters, start point, end points through the script, process it, and there you go. It's all in there. So it's something that makes it really easy to align different geometry assets through a code rather than modeling it. And you can go further than that. People have used this kind of software to create very large, elaborate designs because once you have it down as to your either your algorithm or your inputs or anything you want to do, you can go pretty far with it. And people have been using designers and architects that have been using this kind of uh, low code in combination with coding to create some really uh, interesting design proposals. And even something like this, this is the SoFi Stadium. Uh, I worked at the company where the team would use something like a low code pi uh, program with Python to create this entire lattice of the roof um, that can, on the one hand, give you all those um, different panels, which are triangles, but also create the perforations at different diameters. These were 20 million holes they had to cut, and they did it through a process of low code scripting and Python and C++ and other assets. This is the team that handled it at the uh, architecture company. So this is going to be a sense of what's possible uh, that you really couldn't do. There's no way I can imagine doing this manually on modeling whatsoever. And this is what the coding has been able to allow people to do is something very uh, intricate, but controlled that can then be sent to from design to fabrication to construction like this. So you can see this uh, in the Super Bowl next weekend. Very cool project. And I love this so much, I even went out of my way to not only learn Python for all this, but also create my own course that I released on Autodesk University. Uh, it's uh, Exploring Python Nodes in Dynamo. This is like my way of, just, on one hand, uh, learning more about Python in Dynamo, but also trying to teach others. So I went from novice to teacher pretty quickly in about a year. And the guys holding up these, uh, of course, error logs. Those are the, when, the, when the nodes in the... Uh, uh, that the Python module and Dynamo uh, aren't working. It gives you these yellow boxes and people always get frustrated by them. So I've led people through like, you know, not only how you do these simple kind of operations and how you can use them on projects for all sorts of things, but also how to fix your bugs and errors, which is always fun. Oh, you always feel like a real deal, true developer when you're uh, debugging. So it was a really cool project and link down here. And also I want to show you some other examples of uh, how we can use Python in architecture. Drawings. Uh, I showed you a lot of 3D modeling, but architects are kind of useless unless we have you nice, you know, 2D plan drawings. And one uh, open source project here was a great asset. Was a called PyRevit. It's a plugin for making your own software in Revit. The software I've been showing you all the stuff so far. It's a big unblocker for people from non-CS backgrounds like me in architecture and, and engineering. It's built on Iron Python and other uh, Python wrappers, and it communicates to the C Sharp Revit API. Uh, through its uh, modules. And you can then create your own software. Uh, people have been using this in the architecture and design world to create their own software. These are all you know, Python-based plugins you can make through this interface. And it, it really has been a big benefit. And all it does is just take the documentation that is you know, based in C-sharp, runs in .NET, use that, and then create something in Python with it using the same basic uh, calls and you can do some really great editing with it. So this is the kind of thing we've been doing with uh, Python to create tools. Uh, it's a real great entry way for people who are trying to learn how to just make some simple work in the architecture world. And of course, Blender, uh, it's been gaining a lot of ground in with designers, whether they're just doing product design, video game design, any kind of design. Blender is really awesome, does amazing things. And it's great that you can use Python, C++, and C++ to write add-ons with it. And one of those add-ons is called Blender BIM, which works with this system called IFC OpenShell to export and import objects through any BIM software. They're all basically, you know, um, they're starting to get better, but they're all kind of walled off. Uh, Revit and, and they're like, they're all kind of walled off. So IFC is like this open source kind of exchange format. So Blender BIM with the exchange format of IFC lets you um, create writable format from Blender to any kind of these proprietary BIM formats, which is a godsend because uh, sometimes people have some great stuff in Blender that kind of lives outside of this BIM world, this BIM software world that we can use to exchange it. So you just take the uh, Blender BIM with the open shell through uh, and connect Blender to your um, different softwares for BIM. And you can create cool stuff like this. 
uh, all this is, is is using that combination of taking the meshes that you get naturally out of uh, natively out of Blender, uh, populating uh, the model into 3D masses, then using your assets for windows and doors that you, you add into your model to uh, map them throughout an entire building, and then from there you can create a floor plan as you can see at the end result here, which you can then put on a sheet and then you know send it off to you know show somebody what you have for your design. And you can use this all for you know, traditional architecture, video game design. If you want to be a lot more uh, realistic in the video game design, VR design, whatever. This has been a this is a great way to quickly model something that can then be used as a real architectural asset, all through open source tools, which is great. And you can take it further and use it for something like uh, going from a very quick idea in somebody's head uh, into a whole skyscraper. It's another way we can program a skyscraper from scratch. Real quick lofting of the meshes, adding some facade geometry, and then just trying to see what we can get out of it. And then from there, we can take it to a uh, software that we can use for further study. Very, very fast, very cool. You don't spend hours trying to model this, which is traditionally the problem. And this is all, again, through using open source tools supported by Python. And real quick, I'll show you some other things we do here. Uh, analytical software. This is a Ladybug's tool uh, created by a team uh, with, with a guy named Mustafa. And it just works on just about any geometry engine and just pip install lbt-ladybug. And what's really cool about it is that you can use it for energy analysis. On the right there, you can see a sun hovering on that arc, and you can see where the energy, the, the red is showing up on the floor plan. So you can design a better, more comfortable room, and then also figure out your different options uh, as there's optionary techniques trying to show you, like, you know, you know, run down the different efficiencies you can gain from it all through the Ladybug tools. These are all written by Python, and here's Ladybug's cousin, Honeybee, which is another Python li library to help you visualize the results of data, daylight, and energy analysis. So you can build more comfortable spaces that are more efficient better energy, better comfort, all through these uh, plugins. And this is something more important as we're trying to get better energy uh, sustainability goals in our projects. These are much more important to us these days than ever before. So we try to do our best using these kind of softwares to evaluate the results. And if you go further, Python's a great integrator. You can use it to exchange data formats in XML, CSV, HTML, JSON, um, you know, use it for the backend uh, data engineering and use Jupyter Notebooks and Pandas and all that stuff to create visualization. So I, there's a big growth in using Python just to integrate these different app results, you know, create images of Matplotlib and other libraries. So the whole design world, no matter the architecture, structural engineer, contractor, building things, this is going to become much more relevant in the future is these pipelines and these mapping so solutions. And the future is going to be big data. IoT devices, I'm working on that right now with some of the projects that I have is how can we get the IoT the streaming data to connect to our, I guess you can say static built uh, environments and also create more custom applications so that people can do what they want to do and be on, you know, get to where they want to be. So this is all going to be in the built environment with architecture. And this wouldn't be possible without the open source software maintainers, Dynamo, Grasshopper, Blender, PyRev, and many more. Uh, they've been a big benefit to me and the whole community out there in architecture and design. And of course, Python makes it possible. I love this tool. I love the community. I love everybody uh, that provides insights and information of Python. So uh, it's been a great pleasure for me to be able to contribute anything I can to help people learn themselves some more Python. Now, here's some guides and shout outs. Shout outs to all the open source uh, developers out there for all the software and also links if you try and learn more about any of the things I talked about. There's a whole world out there. You wouldn't believe how much architecture, construction, engineering, built environment stuff is going on with Python and software uh, coding in general, and it's only going to grow. And programming should be fun, so that's why I love Python as well. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me, Twitter, Gmail, whatever, LinkedIn, I'm all there. I'm not going to rickroll you. That's just QR code to my uh, LinkedIn. Um, love to chat with you all you guys. If you have any questions, if you want to learn more, if there's something you want to understand better, by all means, reach out to me. Love to, uh, to connect with you guys. And it's my pleasure presenting today. Uh, rock on Podcast Gates. Awesome. Thank you so much today. Uh, that was a really unique 
And very visually pleasing presentation. So definitely appreciate all that. Uh, we won't have a Q&A with Tade today, so please do feel free to reach out to him with other questions uh, via the social media handles that he shared.